Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Suleiman Bai. I'm the Community Engagement and Outreach Coordinator uh, at the Education City Mosque here in Qatar Foundation. And I'm very excited to be here today moderating this Pitch It session, which brings together six founders, thinkers, and teachers who are reimagining ways of uh, teaching and learning. So each speaker will have five minutes uh, to pitch their education solution to you and the four jury members um, or our jury panel right here. And then each juror will then offer the speaker a feedback and advice. After all the speakers have presented their project, the jury members will select the winning one and uh, in front of you today as the audience. Today's jury's panel, we have Zelmira uh, Polk, uh, Managing Director of Hearth Advisors, a global education and healthcare advisory firm. And we have uh, Cheryl Fu. Um, Cheryl's uh, not yet here. Cheryl, please take a seat. <laughs> Cheryl Fu, Director of APAC and EMEA at Vertec Capital. And Inara Gangji, a student in journalism uh, and strategic communication at Northwestern um, University in Qatar. She's part of the Wise Learners uh, Voice Fellowship. Are we ready to get started? Um, I see some excitement. So we'll get started. Our first innovator is Suha Tutunji, the academic director of the Jusur Refugee Education Program in Lebanon. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome to the stage. Hello. Your, your time will start. No? <laughs> Hello, yeah. everyone. Yeah, so as I was introduced, I'm Suha Tutunji. I'm the head of the education program for the refugees in our NGO called Jusur. Um, we have three uh, learning centers, uh, two in the Bikaa Valley, where the majority of the Syrian refugees are based, and one in Beirut, in an impoverished area in Beirut, where the majority of the students are from Kurdish origin. Uh, what we do is we get them into school, we prepare them for education, and then we send them off to the public schools because they need to, at the end of the day, get an, uh, uh, a certified document that says they were in school and hopefully they will continue their schools. But the challenge was getting the parents interested uh, in their education. So they have this culture, sadly, of not prioritizing education. Education is not... Um, um, a major Hello, issue for them. And so we needed to go into unlearning this, if you want, going with the, uh, with the wise uh, logo, uh, the attitude that education was not important, and get them more involved in their children's education and in their children's schooling. Because studies have shown that there is a positive correlation between the parents who are involved in their children's learning and children not dropping out of school. The drop rate of the Syrian refugees is up to 70%, and so we need to work on that. So we started what we call a family learning program. What we do is we bring in the parents, it's the mothers in this case, to the school, and we run two parallel programs with the parents. One for parents who are illiterate, we do basic literacy and numeracy sessions with them, and one for the parents who have some basic literacy skills. And we teach them some math, some English, some Arabic, some social skills, some life skills, behavior management with their children, so that they get more involved with the children and show some interest in their children's learning. Now, the, the most important part of this program is that half of the day the mothers learn on their own, and the second half they learn with their children in the classroom. So, the learning is basically what they do with the children is the identity program that we teach them about Syria, the culture, the importance of Syria, not the war, the different Syria that they need to know about. And then together, they come up with a project, the mother and child, and that project is based on this identity program. So it could be a folklore song, it could be a dance, it could be what they celebrate, how they celebrate Ramadan, anything that they do. They work together and then they present it, mother and child, to the rest of the mothers who are there. So we hope that the aim of this is for them to bond. The bonding between the parents and the, and the children is very important and then they show more interest. Now the academic part is based on what the children are learning in school. Most of our children go to grade two. So we teach the parents the grade two Lebanese curriculum. So that when the children go home, the parents can ask them, what did you learn today? What, what was your lesson? Let me see your homework. How can I help you? And so they are involved in that. We piloted that project 
last year, and the results were fabulous. The mothers were extremely pleased, and the children were even more pleased. They would go around telling their mates, listen, my mom came to school and we did this experiment and we did this uh, project with them. And the parents now come to us and say, please keep this project running, expand it, so that we have more mothers come in and join. Now, I'm not saying we didn't have any challenges. We had challenges, one of which, how to get the fathers to accept that the mothers come to school. This was a great challenge. And so we had to build trust. And when you build trust, automatically it works out. And this project costs around $100,000. That goes towards transporting parents, uh, paying salaries for the teachers, who are also teaching the mothers and the children at the same time. And of course, a small stipend for the mothers to come to school, a healthy snack, and training for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soha. That was very good, because you only have 20 Wait, seconds. But I have only five minutes, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for sticking to the time. I'm going to ask everybody to stick to the time, because uh, just to be able to catch up, we do have another session. And we'll go to the jury members to hear their thoughts. So um, you have four minutes. I'll start the time. And you can have the microphone. Um, and there's a microphone here as well. So time starts. Hello. Um, hi, Suda. Thank you so much. That was uh, incredibly inspiring. I had um, a few questions. First of all, identity, maths, English, what kind of split? How do you build the day in terms of you, your curriculum? You know, you focus on the culture, the ser but also literacy and maths. Can you tell me yes. just... So we have around uh, 50 minutes uh, per session. It's for three, uh, four times a week for a period of six months over a period of six months. So the mothers come and we divide the lessons. Like they have a schedule, math, okay. Arabic. We didn't include English at the, at the beginning because we're doing basic literacy. But the, the mothers were re requesting English because they wanted to uh, learn what the children were learning. So we added English to the program. Um, I'm going to be quick. The other question I had, parents often have the problem of childcare at home. Yes. So how have you got a model that... Um, um, communities a parent can bring a group of children instead of having to just come with their own? I'm glad you asked this question because I didn't have time to, to answer it, to talk about it. They bring the children with them. The mothers are sitting there, they're nursing their child while doing the lesson. This is the good, the, they're really doing it. And then we have a, like a nursery for the older ones. The children go to the nursery and they play and learn while their mothers with their nursing children are doing the lessons. And my last question is, what is the cost? How many kids are you covering with? You mentioned 100,000. How are you covering this cost? What kind of funding are you getting and, and per child? So it's not per child because we have many other occurring uh, 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 for that. Uh, so it's, we will reach, hopefully, with this $100,000, we will reach more than 500 families. So it's around 120 mothers during the year, because we can't accommodate more than that, and which will eventually reach out to 500 families. And over time, 1,000 and then 1,500, and if we get funds, we will, we will move on with it. So the funding that we got is from friends and people who are interested uh, in, fa in learning, but we need a lot of funds to continue. Fantastic, thank you. Hi. Um so my first question was like, how do you navigate the law in Lebanon? Because I've heard refugee status is definitely hard for them to enroll in schools. Um, as you okay. said, the goal of your program was to enroll them in schools eventually. So how do you navigate the law? We don't. In education, doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. They all go. They get out to go to schools, public schools, for free of charge. Books are paid for. Um, everything else is paid for. They just need to go there. So this uh, this is not an issue at all. Okay, and what has your success rate been for students enrolling uh, successfully into primary schools and then excelling? What kind of assessment strategy do you have for them? We have around 60% who are graduating and continuing. Mm -hmm. We don't know a lot about the other 40 because some are relocated. We don't know and some change the numbers, we can't follow. But we have a monitoring evaluation system where we, uh, we have the grades of the children, how they progress emotionally, socially and academically. We don't just stick to academics. 
and then we try to follow them and see how well they're doing in school because this reflects on us. If they need to make changes, it comes back to us and we make the changes. Thank you. Um, so just one quick question. Do you have any information on the conversion and retention rate? So how many out of 500 families you talked to, how many actually joined the program? Well, we only piloted it. So all of them who we asked to come for the pilot were, they came and they went through the whole program and they didn't miss a single day. So it was a good way also for them to get together and socialize and talk about the problems that are common. And so it, it worked very well, better than we thought it would actually. Great. Thank you very much because that's the four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Suha. Our second speaker is Vincent Bruno, founder and CEO of SparkUp, a digital platform that fosters interaction and collaboration. Vincent, please join me on stage. So my name is Vincent, uh, Vincent Bruno, I'm the founder and CEO of SparkUp. And, uh, but just before that, let me tell you a quick story. I was a, I was a professional magician and, and mentalist for, for 10 years. You know? So I've, I was traveling the world uh, doing magic and, and mind readings, by the way. So I'm not going to read your minds right now, don't, don't worry. And um, so you might uh, ask yourself, how does that relate to, uh, to, to technology and education? Well, uh, it's very connected because right now I'm working into the interaction and collaboration world. I will tell you that in a second. And the secret training of a recipe of a magician is very simple to understand. It's like it's based on how to capture attention, engage your audience, um, how to collect real feedback, and repeat and repeat again, again, and you trick to perfect your effect and memorize it. You know, and it's very interesting because when you compare that to the four key ingredients that make knowledge stick for students, we have exactly the same recipe. You know, we have attention. You need to capture the students' attention and keep them focused. Uh, you have engagement. You want to involve the student and turn them into actors and feedback. Of course, you want to give feedback to your student and you want them to give you feedback and repetition because you want to make them do it again and again until they, uh, they memorize. So the problems uh, are that there is too much today, there is too much uh, one way communication, top down communication in traditional lectures and, and classes. And it's getting more and more difficult to capture uh, uh, student attention. Also, traditional um, methods to measure knowledge and understanding with paper and exam are, are really inefficient right now. And talking about attention with new generation, the average uh, human being uh, loses their attention span seven to ten times per hour. So it's getting more and more difficult to, 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 to ca capture uh, student attention. So the question is like, how can we instantly visualize if the group is keeping up with the content or the teacher and the training, you know? And that's where we uh, created SparkUp. So SparkUp is a live interactive platform. Uh, so we have a collection of like 20 activities. So you can combine them all together. You can create your own scenarios. And um, uh, so and the platform makes, it's really here to push the people to engage and to collaborate during the classroom training. So how does it work? Well, you create your session. So depends, we, we don't work on the content, you know, so the teacher can bring his own content and combine all the activities. It could be polling, live voting, uh, quizzes, it could be true or false. We have a lot of really fun and interactive activities that you combine. You host the event, you have the main screen, you can broadcast uh, your activities and then you can launch activities to the student and interact lively with them. So, so we are actually based in, uh, in Paris, in, in Japan, and uh, since five years and, and in New York, you know. We um, have been done quite like 25,000 so conferences, training, uh, and meetings, training, meeting, training, and as well at B2B. And the business model is um, so it's a web app, and there is no download. You just connect on the cloud. If you want to try SparkUp today, we are using it on the main uh, on the main uh, pitch session. They are using the, the software today, trying us. You know, on, on the question wall. You know, they are using basic activities of the platform to push interaction with the people and to give a voice to everyone. Um, we um, and that's it. And the, the revenue is like two, two million euros. We have like one million uh, euros uh, revenue in uh, uh, annual recurring revenue. So it's a licensing model. And only 30% right now is for education. I mean, and most of the rest of the revenue is based on uh, conferences and meetings. Thank you.
time, Vincent. Uh, we'll go to the jury to uh, hear their thoughts. I, hi, Vincent. Thank you for that. Um, as a jury, I know that we're supposed to um, ask questions, but also give feedback. I just wanted to say the, the, the story of your background is fascinating, very interesting. I didn't really understand what your business is. So you're telling me a million revenue, so I know you're successful, you're doing well, although I don't know, this 30% of that is education, the rest conferences, is this uh, magician shows, mentalist things. Um, underneath it, I'm sure there is something really exciting, but for a pitch, I haven't been able to really understand what you're providing to the kids to keep them focused, to keep them engaged in what is a very competitive environment. Okay, so we are, we are providing an interactive platform for students, more for university. So we work only with university and private school, so more like a, a, yeah, university. And they are using our tool during the classroom training to, uh, the teacher is using it to push and to create interaction with votings and question words and live voting. So we have a collection of activities that the, the teacher is going to use to create interaction, to push interaction during his, uh, his uh, presentation. Great, thank you. I think maybe next time if you gave a bit more example specific, it'd be easier, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, so kind of um, building on what she said, how did you choose these specific activities for your app and how do you think they would specifically improve education currently, like in classrooms? So, so we have basic activities, like we've been doing like to more than 25,000 events and, and trainings and uh, the top activities is like live voting. So the number one activity is used during a, a, a training session is live voting. Then we have like question walls, so people can ask questions. Uh, we have like a lot of assessment tools, so you can keep up with the student during the, the sessions and uh, they can auto-evaluate themselves and you can lively see how the, 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 the students are reacting. So we are not uh, creating like, a, we have games as well, we have tiny games, you know, that you can use. Uh, we are not creating the most amazing uh, activities. We are using simple uh, activities that people can use to interact uh, during the classroom. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Put your hands together for Vincent. Thank you very much, Vincent. Our third speaker is Hossam Hamadi, software engineering manager at the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome to the stage. Hi everyone, this is Hassam. Um, I'm going to pitch um, something what you call uh, Ryan. It's a product that we built at QCRI, which is part of HBKU, Curry Computing Research Institute. So, low-fat diet has been advertised for more than 200 million US consumers and more than 50 million UK consumers over decades. And up to maybe up to your surprise, that has been based on undercooked science. They have recently discovered that this is undercooked science. Thanks for a new clinical trial that has appeared. Now, they suddenly stopped and say, hey, let's unlearn this advice and learn something new. So what's that new? Is that it's okay. Now, clinical trials are the primary research studies that we base our uh, technical and uh, medical uh, learning from. Now, what if you have multiple clinical trials? There are numerous clinical trials, maybe hundreds and thousands of clinical trials that talk on the same topic. So it gives an appearance to what is called a systematic review. So a systematic review is a secondary research that assesses all the clinical trials, all the primary research that has been done in a specific topic. This gives us a better idea about a subject, a treatment. So systematic review, one systematic review can consume, can take from one to two years to just produce one systematic review. It's a, it's a rigorous process, it's, it's uh, uh, time intensive, it's labor intensive, it needs a lot of work, so we have to, again, unlearn this process. How can we semi-automate this or automate this to make results faster? Because, you know, medical subjects are, are, are advancing in a, in a good uh, pace. So we have created Ryan. So Ryan is a web and mobile application. It's an online platform that expedites the production of systematic reviews. That's simply. Now, it's using machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, to uh, find the duplicates because you might search in various uh, uh, clinical trials. There are thousands of, uh, of trials that you are assessing and screening. So it uses these things to rank them, to find duplicates, to recommend things that you haven't seen. 
We have a customer validation. We have started five years ago, and we have more than 50,000 users currently active using the system. Out of these, they are based on 180 countries. Out of these 180 countries, the top 20 countries constitute more than 70% uh, of the user base, only from 20 countries. Now we have a lot of feedback from users. Some of them said, I'm quoting just a minority of the feedback, is that Ryan saved me weeks and months of work. So one of them said, so uh, Ryan made systematic review process a stroll in the park. So we claim that we save 50% of the time of the screening. And this is also validated by an independent study that's done in Sweden in 2017 that proved the same thing. Thanks to Ryan, we saved them 50% of the systematic review production. These top countries are you can, US, UK, Netherlands, um, India, Brazil. The, all the countries are from worldwide. Now, it's used in libraries, it's used in universities, it's used in medical institutions, in medical organizations, in hospitals, in all of, a lot of educational institutes and non-education research institutes. It's a free platform. It's currently being funded by QF, Qatar Foundation, but we're looking at commercialization. We think that there is a big potential. Why? Because yearly, annually, there are two trillion US dollars that are spent on research worldwide. Yeah, it's from all over the world, two trillion, yeah. And then only 10 countries out of this, uh, all these countries constitute 80% of this amount. Now, in Ryan, the top 20 countries, okay, seven countries of the 10 appear in our top 20 countries. So we are actually working with the top one, seven of the 10 top countries that are paying for research, that are, that are having a lot of money that's spent on research. Now, there is also f about competition. So there was also a study that was done this year in 2019. They compared four different tools, four, four uh, top tools for systematic reviews. And Ryan was one of them. And then they said, Ryan is the number one free screening tool. And it's number four across all the tools being paid, being free, not only for screening, for all features. Our future? Our future is to make Ryan number one across all tools, paid free across all features. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Please, I will go to the jury to hear their thoughts. Sure. Um, Hassan, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, just one or two things to clarify. Um, when you mention your number one but number four, can you clarify a little more sure. in terms of how that's been classified, who classified that, yeah. and who your competitors are? So there was a study that was done that collected four uh, popular s tools for systematic reviews. It uh, had 10 different features, and then it measured the, I mean, the availabil availability and ease of use for each feature in all of the four, to four tools. And it ranked them, and it categorized them into free tools and commercial tools. So Ryan was number one okay, across all, all the free tools. Okay. 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 But it's number four overall in all the tools. Um, when you mentioned it cuts in half the time for systematic review, but that review you'd uh, allocated to two years. I'm assuming this is much faster than a year? Yeah, so actually the two years are not all spent on screening. Currently we're focusing on screening. So okay. you start by, let's say, 10,000 clinical trials. You are looking for only a minority, which is like 50 or something. This is called screening. So this is this cause, maybe this is the, the majority of the work is done in this screening phase. We save the time in this screening phase. So we could save weeks and months of work. We did our validation and our customers also did their evaluation. Um, just two quick uh, suggestions. One, if you're going into the corporate world, you have a fantastic test bed here in Qatar. It'd be, I would expect this would be the first place for you to use uh, the product on some of the pharma and the medical work that is being done here. And um, um, second thing has just gone out of my mind, so I'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. So it's being already used in uh, Qatar, uh, HMC and Sidra. So we have some users from Qatar, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and the second thing, I loved your pitch. The only thing I would say is 20% uh, of the top countries and this, uh, you know, there was a bit too much of the seven leading countries and the, st the 10 leading countries. Give me your product, your solution, what you're trying to do. It's great. I, I don't need to know much more of it. Just give me the, the numbers of the amount of trials you're testing on to be able to validate it more. But thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Hi. I also just wanted to clarify. Um, so this is just for clinical trials, so like stuff that's related to health and medicine, right? right. Um, are you thinking about using it for like social sciences or so? Okay, yeah. So uh, while developing Ryan, we're thinking of two uh, kinds of scaling. Vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. So vertical scaling, we're adding features to support the current medical domain. 
but we're also thinking of horizontal scaling where we can support other sciences like maybe life sciences, uh, law, for example, patent search, a lot of things. And actually not all of our users are medical, but most of them are medical. It's a general purpose tool to screen articles. We have users from um, architecture domains, so other domains, but the majority is the medical. But yeah, it's applicable, it's one of the points to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks a lot for your pitch. Um, can you share a bit more about your commercialization model? You mentioned you're looking at scaling up. Yeah. And also, second thing, do you own the IP for this technology? Yeah, so uh, more details about commercialization. We're currently um, uh, talking with QSTP and Career Foundation IP, IPTT office. So uh, we now have a business plan. We have an entrepreneur that came through the EIR program, Entrepreneur in, in Residence. And then um, we are now so, uh, presenting a business model where we have a freemium model. There will be a free uh, I mean, uh, account where you can make unlimited number of reviews if they are public. And if you want a private reviews, you might be given one for free and then you need to pay just to have your work done in a private word. Um, and we have, put, uh, we have compared our pricing to other competitors. We think that we have put it in a way that's highly competitive. It's comparable to them, but it's, it's less. And it's, it's, as, as our uh, customers are saying, it's better in screening. It's the best in screening. So we think that we will have a good portion in the, in the market share. What was the second question? Um, just about IP, but just a quick um, sort of feedback. You might want to look into white labeling um, specific features uh, with big pharma companies across uh, North America as well. That could be an opportunity. Sure, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, that's our time. Thank you very much, Hassan. Thank you. Um, so, our next speaker is Hanan Khadr. Uh, CEO of Hello World Kids, an online learning platform that teaches computer programming to children and adolescents. Let's give her a warm welcome. Okay. The time starts now. Handling too many things. Hi everyone. Uh, I am Hanan from Jordan. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Hello World Kids. In a nutshell, Hello World Kids uh, has developed a coding curriculum for schools to replace the obsolete uh, ICT curriculum, uh, starting from a very early age, a grade one. And um, we have developed a platform to identify the uh, talented uh, students as early as possible through analyzing how their code is written. So, I'm sorry. Let me ask the question, why schools are still insisting not to enroll coding as part of their core curriculum? Don't they know that coding is becoming the new literacy? Don't they know that the demand for programmers is the highest, one of the highest in the future? The answer is they do. They do know, but they don't know how. They need help. Teachers are not programmers, and programmers, they don't get into the education field. So, who's lost in between? The students, our children, the future. In 2015, I have created Hello World Kids, social impact with a profitable strategy company. And the first product was a print curriculum. The print curriculum was for, can, can, I, can I launch the, uh, the slide? Just just like, yeah. The first, the first program, uh, the first product was the print curriculum that is actually books and being purchased by uh, schools every year. So it's from grade one until grade nine, and it is going to be until grade 12. Though, it is a nice model, sustainable. When you get in a uh, school, it's very difficult to be kicked out. Uh, it's a recurring model, but it has lots of challenges. So. The main challenge was how it is reliable on teachers. It's much easier to teach coding for a kid, and it's much easier to teach coding for a teacher. So the other thing is that we compete with publishers, and this is not our core business. We are a technology company. So in 2017, I convinced a, a, a group of investors to invest by 700,000 US dollars as a seed round to build Hello Code. Hello Code is the online platform. It is an interactive platform that teaches coding through stories, um, uh, movies, watching movies, songs, and so on, for kids to learn, assessment, and then they collaborate and share. 
we're heading towards creating a GitHub, but for children. Let me show you a glimpse on this. Watch this. Mm! Don't worry, I'm still here. I'm just hidden. <laughs> I am creating an application. So left eye is ellipse with 50. Height, 50. I am now an official programmer. For the online platform, we have launched it this year and we have 1,500 students currently learning inside the schools the curriculum online. For the print curriculum, and it will never die, we also have, um, uh, in the past uh, two years, we have generated very good revenue out of that. That's 300,000 US dollars. Um, Competitive advantage. Why would schools come and pay for Hello World Kids and Hello Code? Why there is Hello uh, Code.org is free online. MIT Scratch is free online. The reason is that Hello Code is pedagogy, clear scope and sequence, very power, very empowering for the teachers, multilingual. So it's in Arabic and English. So the, this region opens its ha their hands to this pro uh, this platform. It is identifying the talented, which is talented as early as possible, which is something every one of us needs. The school, the community, and the country. Um, the team, we are a, a group of 10 people, uh, very tech it savvy people, and based in Jordan. And we have entered this year five markets, five new markets, including Pakistan and Turkey. And we expect five times, five to 10 uh, times growth in 2020. And we're becoming profitable this year, inshallah. Uh, the last thing is the ask. Uh, we are uh, in, um, in the process of uh, closing our uh, Series uh, A uh, round by end of 2020 and we're looking to raise uh, 2.5 million US dollars to invest in customer acquisition, expanding the new market, building the gamification more properly and, uh, and finally investing in the machine learning for talent acquisition. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Manan. <laughs> Thank you. That was very kind of you. Um, so we now go to our jury members to hear their thoughts. Um, Hanan, thank you so much. That was very well presented. Um, I really mainly had one question. Could you elaborate? I thought the pitch was great, but I didn't. If you're looking to raise the next round, so you're looking to speak to the investors in the room and try and attract, I didn't get any information on your business model. So I know that you've raised 700. I know that you're looking to raise another two and a half, that you've got substantial growth, that you're going international. However, there's no indication apart from going selling to schools how your business model works. Uh, it is a B2B laser focus in the past two years, but we are d delivering B2C for in, um, in centers in our, in our country in Jordan. So there are a lot of students that come by parents, their parents register them. So this is the B2C. For the online, it is open for B2C. So anyone, any parent of you, they can go to the platform and they register the child. And it is a SaaS model, so they pay per student and pay per level. Uh, for schools, no, the schools, they purchase from us uh, per students, so at an annual. So it's like they buy from Oxford, Cambridge, the uh, yearly curriculum, and then they sell it to the schools, to the students. It's, it's the same way. So it's mainly laser focus on B2B, but we are investing in this, uh, the next round. We are investing in the B2C. Uh, fantastic. Last thing, just for some feedback, just having a little more financials in terms of the cost per school, cost per student, what kind of growth you've had month on month, what does the, the 5 to 10 uh, you know, growth sure. really means, would be great to kind of add in to, to be able to capture the attention of sure. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. I just wanted to clarify, you were saying that you want to replace ICT curriculums in schools. How do you convince schools as well as parents that your curriculum is better in terms of that I've been through ICT education and you know you learn other things other than like just software development you learn about hardware about the history of technology etc how do you convince schools this is the only thing they're supposed to give their kids uh, it's not the only thing coding is not the only thing hello world kids is consists of three stages the first stage is the computer literacy and digital literacy in general that's for the grade 1 2 and 3 Start, coding starts from grade uh, uh, four, five, six, and seven, and then there is the the speciality stage, 
That's after the, tenth, uh, the ninth grade, where the uh, students, they learn trending technologies like blockchain, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, and so on. So it is a complete, comprehensive curriculum for schools. And the schools, they know that the, the, the ICT uh, curriculum that they are teaching is very, very obsolete and outdated. Um, do, do you also add any other sort of education? Because you talked about blockchain and AI. Um, do you also teach students about sort of values that govern technology? I know these are really young kids, they, but um, do you do. have a more of the story in the cartoon, maybe something like that? Yeah. Every every cartoon video, the episode ha is is very grounded to the, to ethics. It's very grounded to community, and it's very localized. So when you watch the Arabic videos, you will see that it is cultural. It's, it's, it's according to the culture. When we, start, when we put that in uh, one of the uh, uh, international uh, countries like Pakistan, in Pakistan, yes, we did a lot of changes also in the, in the customization and the content so that we can really become a localized platform that reflects the, uh, the, the community, the society, and the culture. Perfect. That's our time. Thank you Thank very you much, so Hanan. much. Thanks. Perfect. So our next speaker is Stuart Bamford, co-founder of Kingsland Pre-Prep, a pre-prep nursery in London, challenging the culture of box ticking, the box ticking education. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome to the stage. Please, Stuart. After, <laughs> afternoon, everyone. As you said, my name is Stuart Bamford. Um, I'm actually the CEO, co-founder of Kingsland, which is one of my schools, but actually Rocket Productions, which is a, a company that owns uh, three schools in, in central London. Um, the Rocket, I wonder if, yeah. The Rocket side of Rocket Productions comes from this image, which is actually, obviously, Neil Armstrong coming down to uh, say his famous words in, in that epic 60s uh, journey of uh, human accomplishment. Um, and that was an image that came from my grandfather who worked for NASA exclusively on the Apollo missions. Um, in, and when Neil Armstrong was in line, he was the, the sending the TV signal to the rest of the world. So I grew up in a household which is stories around adventures and exploration and you know, uh, all those fun things that actually, you know, which makes us human. Um, so basically I've started, a, I exist, the schools exist in central London, which is a very, very unique part of the world in education in that it's a, it's, it's a very conservative type of approach, which if to put it in perspective, I run schools for two, three, four, five year olds um, in Chelsea and all of my children 100% are assessed at the age of three or four to get into their next schools. Um, therefore, you can imagine the type of culture that sort of promotes and also the type of box ticking um, culture um, that also in ensues, especially with, with parents. So my whole concept around bringing enjoyment and education, which seem to not coexist in the same sentence in, in, in London schools, um, probably a lot of schools globally, but back into the same uh, context, especially for children at this age. So we not only have created uh, an amazing uh, small group of schools, um, but uh, in terms of what we're doing, we create theatres of learning. I don't even call them classrooms. It's, it's around imagination. Um, so the next slide, which is 2015, which when I say to people without that image, that's why I've got a big boring image there, but when I say without, they think of the year, but it's actually the time. So the time, 2015, comes from this next image, which is when obviously Big Ben becomes Neverland. It's a time when children dream, it's a time when you imagine, it's a time when anything can happen. And this is really the pinpoint of our education approach, is bringing imagination back into children's lives in school. So it's a huge part of our curriculum because we've all paid for, we've all seen, we've all gone on experiences, we're coming to WISE, you'll walk away feeling energised, whether it's music, WISE, um, theatre, whatever it might be, and you almost gain that confidence to then go out and be courageous. And that's really the centre point for our, our approach in education. Um, this is moving away from my child needs to learn how to write their name and therefore get into this prep school or get into this next school into actually let's rethink education, let's unlearn and let's rethink what we can do with them and actually bring a whole world of open possibilities to them which really that's what they are. So 
Our whole premise is that the first thing is their children are innate explorers. So that's where the explorers of almost the Neil Armstrongs, the astronauts, the people behind the scenes. We call them rocketeers. Our students are not students or, or children, they're rocketeers. They're on their own adventure at our schools. So what happens is we create these environments, and I wish I could show you some of the visuals of the schools, but they're incredibly theatric, big schools with huge imagination uh, for the children. And that creates that, that, that wonder, that spark, that like we're all getting from wise, um, and which, inhibit, which breaks away the barriers and actually makes the children sort of be courageous. Um, and that's what we want. We want motivation to be courageous for risk-taking children. So when we do that, we then move them on to, if you've got motivation, then you are a go-getter. You're, you're out there sort of persevering and using your adaptability as a child to sort of think of a, a project-based um, slight curriculum to adapt, to rethink, to collaborate, to work with each other. It's a huge part of uh, who we are and what we do with the children. And it's amazing how our theatres of learning, remember classrooms, all of a sudden don't become dead spaces. They, there's, there's, there's no... They, not one of our children want to leave our, our theatres of learning. Uh, they actually stay and that's where they want to live their lives almost. It's their imagination because they're living inside their storybook. Um, which is just a, a fabulous thing for children. As you can see, I'm almost having more fun watching the children behind us. But once they're involved and they're uh, having a, an amazing time, that's a centre point of what we do at Rocket Productions. We almost say imagination is fueled by Rocket Productions. And Kingsland was obviously the, the school that was, I was invited to WISE to speak about because it, sort of, uh, it, it really sort of broke down those barriers in, in, in London. That's nine seconds left. So <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you for respecting the time, Stuart. Your project sounds very interesting, and I just kind of caught a glimpse of his boots. I'm feeling the boots. <laughs> so we'll go to our jury to hear their feedback. So, A um, few pieces of feedback. First of all, fantastic. Um, I, I love the background on your family and NASA. I would have liked to know a little more about your personal background. Were you a teacher? Where did you come from? What qualified you to look at the space as a parent? I also, you know, I understand this issue, which is unfortunately, you know, unfortunately a, a horrible issue in the UK and a very elite. Um, you still need to prepare the kids for those assessments if they're going that route. So the skills, motor skills, numeracy. Um, are you still doing that? What kind of results are you seeing in this new approach? So I love the pitch, but I didn't really get results, how you're going about this, to, because the parents are still going to want to have the kids that are ready for this assessment. So how are you going about it in a different way mentally? Are these kids uh, coming out? Are you testing this? Are you got data on it? That kind of information would have been quite good, you know, more valuable. Yeah, totally. Thank you. This is the sort of Hopefully, I mean, it's because of the five five minutes, and I'm glad you sort of brought that up. My history is 20 years in education, been in the classrooms. I started the schools 10 years ago. I've got 10 years of feedback on, on these schools. Um, in terms of central London, if you look, my parents have, like, my inbox is full because they're going through the assessment process at the moment, but we recently had about 38 children go for assessments. There was 120 offers, more than any other school. Um, therefore, the results in terms of thinking outside the box... Um, and actually how it's working and even what the next schools are looking for. Um, as sort of Larry said in, um, today, it's through different projects you can slip in the right sort of information that will get them over the line. Um, but that really, I don't coach them for the assessments at all. It's just they're, they're interested in learning. Um, that's a huge part of it. And that's actually as a parent, I'm a parent myself, and that's really what I want for my, for my boys, is to be really interested in learning. So we provide that institution as well. Thank you. Hi. So I just had a question on how you recruit students to join the school. Do you pay attention to diversity, financial inclusion, etc.? Yeah, so we're one of those schools that because of the, uh, because of the area of the part of the world we are, that obviously education is very competitive. I think you could pretty much, if you find the space in central London, you could open a, a space and you, you'd have it full because there's such a need for ed education and good education, um, even though British education is such a brand. Um, so we are in a privileged position where I might have 40 offers that I, I uh, send out per year for families, which is on diversity and in, in, in all those aspects. Um, but we'll have up to 500 um, uh, applicants for those places. So it's a, it's, a, it's a hugely competitive market. Unfortunately, we're in it. Um, and then when you try to create a model which exists outside of it, you still create the competition to get into your environment. So which is why it's nice to sort of... I'm building, you can follow me, but I'm building my third school in Notting Hill, which is another competitive area of London. And it's nice to see the growth of our approach and more opportunities for more families to join us. Thank you. 
Um, just following up on a question, you didn't talk about financial inclusion. So what about the less privileged children? Yeah, so in the UK they have uh, a, a certain amount of hours that the government funds for hours and we do offer that program. So there's, there's uh, an ability for, children, uh, for parents who may not have the full fees to obviously um, be helpful by the government. Um, we are an institution that is obviously privately owned and therefore there's constraints with uh, sort of what we need to achieve as well. Um, which is just a reality of it. Unfortunately, if I was five plus, I might get a little bit more help from the government on those. But we, any, any money than funding that comes from the government to help families, we get for them and pass that back onto the families 100%. Thank you very much, Stuart. That's our time. Thank you. Um, our final speaker is Silvio Piros, Head of Education at the Institute for European Studies. Let's give him a warm welcome to the stage. All right. Uh, well, thank you for having me to here today and this uh, brief uh, time that I have uh, to, to share with you. Uh, we have an idea that is pretty much in, in, in progress and a key message that I want to convey with you. And it's simple and it has been conveyed throughout this, this morning in the plenary. And if you go everywhere in each of the sessions, I'm sure it's being discussed. And that is creativity as a skill for 21st century. So we, what we've tried to do is to find a way in which we can teach creativity and online. So we are getting ourselves in a lot of trouble for this. Um, so let me try to do three things in this five minutes that I have. Uh, first, I want to talk to you about why we need creativity and how can we teach creativity. Second, I want to discuss about art, art as the linchpin and as a means, as a vehicle to, to teach creativity. And finally, online, digital education, why we can teach creativity online and how to do it. So I don't have to convince you that creativity is one of the fundamental um, ways in which humanity has progressed. It's also a an, an distinctive element of what it means to be human. Um, and above all, creativity is the key driver of progress and innovation. But at the same time, our educational system across the world have struggled in the past decade or so to recognize creativity um, and to nurture creativity, uh, if not suppress it. This is mainly what they've, they've, they've managed to do. Uh, there's, there's compelling research, there's research carried in the past 50 years that now shows that when kids go into school at the age of five, and by the time they, they reach the workforce, their creativity levels drop from 98% to 2%. There's Ken Robinson, Land's uh, research, there's a lot out there, you can see that. So that's, that's certainly a, pro a problem that we need to address. Why we need to address it? Because like we discussed this morning, all the skills that are relevant to the 21st century um, have creativity and collaboration at the core. We need to take a model that was based on the achievement of students on a very, very narrow spectrum and move it to a collaborative and creative model. So we think art can be the tool for this. Um, and we've run a model in the UK, and we have a proof of concept uh, that shows that art can be to creativity what English is to literature. Why? For at least a couple of reasons that I'm going to mention briefly. First of all, it's a personal pro a process. It really puts the student at the center of it. Um, it's pragmatic. Um, and it's a process in itself that makes it very relevant because the outcome, while it's important, the process can be identified and further fleshed out. Now, the third thing, and this, this brings me to, to the meat of, 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 of the talk, is how we think we can address this problem um, through online learning. Why online? Well, because it transcends geographic boundaries. boundaries. We can get teachers from across the world and create and foster a genuine uh, online community of practice. Now the model of the course is it's in a such way that it is a peer mentorship continuum where teachers can hop in, follow a number of modules, can go out, practice building their curricula with what they've learned. They can come back to discuss the struggles that, that have, they have encountered and so on and so forth. It's scalable um, because of the design we're working on um, uh, teachers from across the world can really 
influence each other, but they can also peer, they can mentor each other in, in a way that, that everybody peers somebody else and is peered by somebody else. So there's, there's a sort of um, um, equal sense in it. Um, so we think that, that this can be then built with limited resources or, or we can make the most out of, res um, of the resources that we have. If we build a course and we run it, one instructor can teach up to 80 teachers at, at one time. So I think um, it functions. So just to wrap up, these are the three ideas that I, I'm really curious to, to discuss with you and get your feedback. Uh, we want to build creativity course online uh, we want to, to get teachers from across the world in the first phase, then their institutions, and then obviously we're looking at other um, social partners that we can engage this to make this uh, a scalable model, uh, something that we can further increase and disseminate. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, you. Silvio. Um, we'll go to the judges, I mean, or to the jury, and let, hear their thoughts. Um, thanks so much, Silvius. Um in terms of giving feedback, um, I think it's really important for you to look at the room mm -hmm. and say, who is in the room? And everyone here, to a certain degree, agrees with you that creativity is super important. Mm -hmm. I felt that you spent too much time focused on creativity, mm -hmm. the importance of it, what's happening with it, and didn't get to the meat, mm -hmm. as you said at the end. So let me get to the third. Mm -hmm. Now, right at the end of your pitch, you mentioned one to 80 teachers mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm bringing these tools, I have no idea what your product or service is. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, I'm sure most people in the room do, but if you could kind of skip straight to this is what we have, because peer-to-peer has now become quite a cliche phrase, everyone is trying to do peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. That is incredibly important, but I'd love to actually know how are you doing this? What is the service and model? That's just for feedback, which, All right. thank you. Yeah, if I can answer you now. That, that's perhaps true, and probably my, my academic side that is probably we don't dwell too much on uh, on uh, the theoretical part and the substance. So the product is it's it's very simple. It's an online course that we mean to build in the first phase for teachers, and then for institutions, and then ideally scale it up and bring other social actors, um, in which in the first phase teachers can look at what they teach and how they teach and redesign and rebuild their curriculum with the use of art and, and to okay. boost their creativity. That's great. That, that super helpful. Thank you so much. All right. Hi. So kind of building off of that, um, can you please define how your modules in particular are related to creativity? Like how do you define creativity? What are different outcomes that you're measuring in these courses? And like just like the how, you know? How we do it. Um, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so we ran a, um, a pilot in a school in, in the UK. Um, but this was different from the online uh, work because it was done in class. Um, and when we used a set of tools. Uh, we looked at the literature and how creativity is defined, the usefulness of the art of creation and the use from the side of it. Uh, so we have all this model. Now, the, the, the real challenge is, is to, to transition this and redesign it for online purposes, which is uh, the, the, the part that we work on right now. I still think you weren't a little clear about exactly what your models entail. You're talking about art. Mm -hmm. How are you intending to teach art through a phone or an app? You know. Well, uh, so we, we're not planning to, to build an app with a platform. Um, we're actually planning to use a platform that, that exists out there. Um, and well, in the first phase, and that's why I said we involve teachers, we wanted to get a lot of input from their side to see how they teach and what's missing and sort of build it from there. So we don't start with a predefined model. So we've run the pilot so we know how it works in a certain school, in a certain place, in face-to-face -face teaching. But we'll just use as a guideline for the online model that we build. Okay, thank you, right. Sylvie, for pitching your idea. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all of you for your attention. Uh, I'm going to ask the jury members if they'd like to take some time to deliberate really quickly, about two minutes or three, uh, and then you can come back to us with a verdict. Perfect. So um, we're back on again. That was not too long, uh, but uh, they know the time is pressing. So uh, I thank you for that. I'd uh, like to ask the jury to, um, to actually say who they um, chose as the winner. Uh, 
Um, it was a difficult one, but we uh, would choose Suda for her work in refugee camps. We thought it was a fantastic model that really should be scaled extensively. Put your hands together for Thank Suda Tatunji from the Suda Refugee Project. That is awesome. We're talking about education. I don't believe in winners and losers. I'm sure you don't as well. You know, it's all about every single initiative that was presented today is making a life and uh, a difference in someone's life, children's life, uh, all over the world. So all of you are winners. And uh, I mean, there's only uh, ways to improve. And you've heard a lot of great feedback from our jury. I thank them. I thank the audience for their attention. I thank uh, you uh, for pitching your ideas. And... Um, this basically brings us to a close, but I don't want to forget someone who's been doing an amazing, amazing, amazing job. On my left, on your right, our court stenographer taking great notes, documenting everything. Please put your hands together for her. And uh, the people doing the sound and uh, mics on the back over there, Stefan, and, uh, you know, please put your hands for them as well.